Reginald. Reginald, Reg, Reggie, Sir Reggie. Sir Reggie, Reginald. Reg. Reg, thanks for um thanks for making time. Welcome to the Testify podcast. Thank you. Thanks for putting your hand up. Well, uh, Pedro pushed me to to um, and suggested I share the story. Oh well, thank you, Pedro. We uh we sometimes feel like we're dragging people in here, <laughs> kicking and screaming. <laughs> it, it's not always the easiest. Yeah, well, I don't, you know, normally push myself forward, but I. Uh, uh, he he. Pedro said, "You've got a story. Please tell it. Tell it. You know." So that's great. Mm. Great. So, uh, little background on you, Reg. Where were you born and raised? Brisbane. A Brisbane yeah, kid. Yeah, Brisbane boy. Wow. And uh, lived uh, half of my life down here at Burley Heads because we uh, owned a house at Burley at, and not far from here, Acanthus Avenue. I'm one of seven children. Um, grew up, uh, my parents were uh, from Lismore. They were, uh, my father was a dairy farmer there. Uh, they moved up here around wartime uh, during the Second World War and got work up here. Um, and then so I was born just after the war and, uh, and so I grew up in inner city Brisbane. Kangaroo Point, and uh, went to school in, in the inner city, and it was uh, full of uh, uh, you know a lot of migrants coming in. So the school was full of uh, sort of Greeks and Italians and uh, various <laughs> other people. Uh, mainly, they were drawing people from there in those days because there was a, a, a you know, economic boom in Australia after the war. For for um, for some of the younger generation, what's What's one of the biggest man-made things that we just wouldn't be aware of now? Like, for example, we got the Seaway Spit and we've got the buildings, like we know those. Yeah. But I know that just as I cruise around, when I when I see old photos of the Gold Coast and the yeah. Brisbane, I'm like, what? That wasn't always here. We made that? Yeah. What, what's one of the biggest well, man-made differences? Well, it's just uh, development. When we were at Acanthus Avenue, which is just behind the Burley School here, Billy's state, state School. Oh, yes, yeah. Right. So that's now a canal estate, but uh, we were in a house and behind that was swamp. Oh, wow. So, there was, so the Gold Coast was just a strip which wasn't much beyond the Gold Coast Highway. Uh, all of that was new houses uh, in those days and that was in the uh, 50s, 60s. And um, so everything on the Gold Coast has kind of taken off from there. Uh, so everybody camped in those days and if you see old pictures or even there's paintings that you see around the place that uh, you see a lot of the Burley campground. We used to camp right on the water. We would step out of the tent and onto the beach at Burley and go swimming every day. So that was, it was oh, just a bliss beautiful. for six weeks during the school holidays. Oh, it would have been beautiful. <laughs> Did you remember on the Gold Coast the uh – I can't remember what it's called, Magic Mountain. Was it a chairlift? Yeah, it was a chairlift, yep, at Nobby, yep. I saw photos of it. I couldn't believe yeah. it. It Magic Mountain was like, at Nobby's was like a like a little carnival thing or? Yeah, that's right. It, well, there was a restaurant at the top, I think, from memory, and, um, and that was but built when we were establishing the house, you know. But we started at coming and visiting Burley here. My grandmother lived at Burley Heads up on the hill from the uh, main centre. She looked right down onto the uh, main park there. I forget the name of it now. Did she own a property up there? Yeah, she owned a house there, yeah. Oh and I used to stay with her uh, sometimes uh, being my, uh, when I was small. She probably paid $12 for the property back then. <laughs> well, we bought the, our block of land, which was a nice quarter acre block for £500, which was $1,000 now. And then my father put a, bought a, a house, which was uh, an old Queenslander, which for removal... It was being moved from one place to another. You got that for five hundred pound, and so we had a beach house on a quarter acre block in Acanthus Avenue. Uh, at Burley, for a, yeah, at Burley for a thousand for a th- pound, a thousand pounds. So. Which today, and then he'd, that's right. That place would be worth. It is. Yeah, I've been to the house, the old house. It's been basically built around. I think they moved the old Queenslander, and, and uh, yeah, it's a, it's a lovely little spot there. And then he did the same thing at Miami. Same thing, and. Um, there was a block of land there. All the land was around 500 pounds in those days. 
So, um, if, only a thousand, a, if only you had a couple thousand pounds back then. Yes, I was thinking as I was coming down, and I wish I had my grandmother's house because she had a beautiful spot. And we, as we walked down uh, from her house, the trees were just full of koalas. And uh, oh, really? Yeah, she used to feed all of the kookaburras and uh, whatever other bird life on her veranda. No Lovely joke. Lovely veranda, yeah. There, there was tons of koalas. Tons of koalas. You'd see them as we walked down the hill from her place to go for a swim. Um, we would just look up in the trees and there's koalas everywhere, you know. I can count on one hand <coughs> the amount of times I've seen a wild koala. Mm. You, you just don't see them anymore. Yeah. Jesus. No, that's right. Well, it was it was really wildlife and, of course, uh, Flay's uh, Wildlife Sanctuary is, oh, yeah, just uh, is in here. West Burley and... Uh, yeah. So uh, that was there, yep. So uh, um, it was so it was kind of like a second home for us here. And then at one stage, um, my uh, uh, my mother and my young brother and sister came down to live here. Dad was still working in Brisbane, and uh, they came and lived down here and went to school here. So kind of between weekends and and uh, holidays. And eventually I joined the Burley Lifesavers, of course. It was a bit natural for me when I was about 13 or 14 and uh, eventually ended up at Tugan Lifesavers. Um, so lifesaving was a big part of my growing up years and my teens. And uh, so it's like a second home. So to actually walk around here today, I have a lot of memories for Burley like and that. West Burley and, um, and uh, you know, it was uh, lovely just uh, praying that God would continue to... I always feel that where your roots are and where God sort of touches your heart in different ways, um, there's, a, uh, there's a kind of a, a heritage there yeah. and, uh, and you have a kind of a birthright to, to claim and bless that area because... Uh, oh, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, uh, you know, I was saved uh, uh, when I was 17 and, um, and then I... Uh, but I was still in the Lifesavers then so I was coming down to here to do patrols and... And I remember uh, uh, we were in Kilangatta on New Year's Eve and uh, there was, the kids were just all raucous because we were all the baby boomers, so the place was packed with uh, teenagers. And uh, anyway, there was a bit of a, you know, a bit of a party and street party and all that kind of thing. And, uh, but eventually we, I got to the stage where I, uh, I, after it was all over and they yahooed the police and so on, uh, I had this. <laughs> yeah, who the police? <laughs> oh, they banged on their cars and <laughs> stirred them up, but that was pretty harmless fun. Uh, nothing destructive, just noise. Yeah, yeah. And dancing and so on. And uh, but at the end of it, it was kind of rain, and so it was a bit of a dampener on the on the party. And I was walking back from Kilangatta back to Tugan to uh, uh, to go back to the, the surf life saving where I was staying, and uh, I found myself thinking, this is pretty empty. And I was only a new believer about a month because uh, it was around, uh, yeah, just at the end of November, beginning of December, 64. And then uh, I just had been exposed to a Christian uh, youth group and um, uh, went to a camp for theirs up on the Sunshine Coast and <clears throat> and was touched by God, which is another story. And um, But uh, just uh, the comparison between that and what, we were st- uh, doing down at Kilangatta that night. I just thought, and I said, "That's enough. Uh, this is. I'm going to walk away from this lifestyle now." And I did, and uh, I just set myself so far then on for uh, following Christ and into His kingdom and His purposes. Very interesting. So, what happened a month prior at the Christian camp, and how did that come about? Obviously, yeah, well, you saw something amazing for you to. Then be down having a Yahoo <laughs> with the well, rest of the young I, I, people and uh, yeah. want change. Um, well, we, uh, my, my mother had the Salvation Army background, uh, her family side of things. Okay. Uh, we were in the inner city. My, uh, all of our family were musical. We had our own band. Um, we all played uh, at least two instruments. Uh, but we also got involved with uh, brass bands. So I was going to say piece. very Salvation Army, the brass band type, isn't it? Yeah, well, eventually, because through my mother's influence, I'd say, uh, we went to the Salvation Army uh, temple in, in Brisbane as, for Sunday school when I was very, very small. Which one? The, t- the city temple in, in Ann Street. Oh, okay. oh in Ann Street. Mm, the, oh, the main right. headquarters yeah, there. Yeah, right in there. Yeah, and... Um, the, uh, so I have a lot of sweet memories there, but even when they were doing open air meetings and all the people were yahooing <laughs> and yelling and at the preachers, you know, and, uh, I can I was playing the triangle 
at three years of age, ding, ding, ding. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so I was exposed to open air preaching even when I was three. And when you say people were yahooing and oh, they were just laughing and mocking uh, the oh, preacher. Oh, really? Yeah, they used to give uh, any street preachers or open air preachers. I'd give them a hard time. Oh wow! Yeah, there were places in Brisbane where you could go and they'd have a public park. There's a a park down near the valley, and uh, on Sunday anybody could talk on any subject, and uh, and so they would get up there and people would laugh at them, mock them, challenge them, and some of it was serious, and some of it was philosophical, and some of it was religious. So the valley and the city, um, uh, that was kind of my environment. Yeah. But then the, the coast was our time to get away from that and so it was, a, it was much more holiday and relaxed and surf and, and it was wonderful. So it, we had that contrast of inner city living and then living on the Colco coast a lot. Yeah, you know. personal little question. What was the drive like down to the coast back then? Two hours. Two hours? An hour from... Kangaroo Point to Mount Gravatt. Whoa. <laughs> what was no, the road? No like? freeways. It was just, just a one, two lane highway you know, that's going both ways. So, like um, bitumen or yeah, like gravel? Yeah, bitumen, bitumen. Uh, but once you get off the bitumen, there was a lot of sand roads and dirt roads. Onto the Gold Coast would have been all sand roads, yeah. eh? Uh, there was, yeah, some, some parts of it. Uh, but um, the road, it, it was the. Uh, Main Pacific Highway, which or the uh, what do they call it? The M1 now, but uh, it was Highway One. That's what it was, and um, that went right around Australia. And uh, Whoa. Uh, so that was Highway One, yeah. And so did that come through surface? Yes, it did. The, what you would call the Gold Coast Highway today was Highway One. Was Highway One? Yeah. Wow. Well, and that was the only main road. So you just pulled off to surface or Southport. Um, main beach, and then you just followed the beaches down, and uh, and people would uh, just go off there and basically camp along that strip, and it was all sand dunes and things like that. Yeah, so. that's what I was so fascinating. All of uh, Chevron Island, yeah. all that was just sand dunes. It's so fascinating to me because it's so developed now. I just can't picture it. Well, we we remember the first uh, multi. There was only motels being developed, and they were. The Pink Poodle was always famous. I still, I think oh, they've still, still got there. the sign up there. It was still, it got redone. Yeah. yeah they redid it. Yeah. And uh, that was fascinating for us because, uh, you know, oh, a motel, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> Didn't know such things. But that was, uh, yeah, it started to happen in those days. And then um, we, uh, the, I remember the first high rise building, the Broad Beach Hotel was the first building around surface and uh, broad beach, which was more than uh, a single level motel or maybe just, you know, up and down from a motel. But anything, it was a multi-storey building. That was the first one. My brothers uh, played uh, music in there on a Sunday afternoon in the, in, the, uh, in the beer garden, also down here at the Burley Hotel. Wow. Uh, they used to do uh, gigs there uh, because they were, uh, became professional musicians. They were great. Uh, my, my grandmother owned... One of the hotels, I think, fifty Cavalav. Right. What was there? Was there a pub there? Well, Caval Avenue was the place for people to gather in um, in the um, you know for for the young people, and uh, Coolangatta was the place down this end, uh, down in the main street. Do you remember? Do you remember um, if the main pub or hotel or something at Cavalav, what that was called? I don't. I, okay. uh, I uh, even though I visited Surface as part of Surf Club competitions, um, I I didn't. We didn't ever stay at Surface. We only passed through oh, there okay. on the way to Burley. So our kind of experience was Burley to the to the border. That was where uh, we were on the southern end of the coast mainly. And when you're young, you're not looking at those. You're not looking nah. particularly at geography. You're just thinking about what you're going to do and the yeah. fun you're going to have. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so back to um, yeah. Brisbane. So we, yeah, so had the exposure to the gospel through Salvation Army. Yes. There was a, um, uh, I have a very sweet memories of uh, my Sunday school teachers who were very loving and caring. And um, I remember seeing a picture of Jesus with a lamb across his shoulder, which was a common picture in Sunday schools. And <laughs> so that, uh, that was there and that always, I always remembered that as a little child. And I remember pantomimes and Christmas events and, but I uh, slowly, and, and I've got a, uh, still got a picture here of, of uh, uh, our four, my three brothers and myself all playing instruments. So they 
two of us, uh, I played the cornet, um, brother played a, uh, a flugelhorn, uh, another one played a, uh, a, uh, a euphonium, that's my eldest brother, and then there was another so in between one beca- between those. When you say you got a photo here. I've got a, yeah, I've got it here. Did yeah. you bring it? Yeah, it's on my phone, I can dig it up for you. Yeah, can we have a look? Do you want to do it this now or a bit later? Yeah, no, can we do it now because we'll show it on the podcast. Oh, uh, okay, yeah. all right. Um, what happened at the what happened at the youth camp in Sunny Coast? And well, how, we, how we, did that come about? Well, we uh, well we got out of as I grew up, we got away from the band. There was a a bit of a clash between my father and one of the uh, officers in the uh, Salvation Army, one of the members of the band, and uh, they had a disagreement because uh, they uh, they didn't approve of us. Um, playing in a police citizens youth band. <laughs> it was in those days it was church and the world and so that Keep was a problem. Separate. So, yeah, yeah, yeah and, yeah. and he uh, accused us of using uh, uh, Salvation Army instruments in a, in, a, in a secular citizens band. Oh, wow. God forbid. <laughs> Would you oh, be well, offended that- by that to today? <laughs> However, it, it was our own instruments. We had our own musical band. It was a mistake. But father was uh, was a bit of a hothead, and uh, so he uh, uh, he took offence at that and pulled us all out, which was sad because we were all pulled away from an exposure to the what, a lot of the good things that were happening oh, for us in the Salvation Army. So so then they we just went secular, just played musical, did gigs like we did country dances and all that kind of thing, old fashioned sixty forty dances. And uh, my brothers went into an uh, amateur competition in Sydney and they won it. Um, uh, in, uh, on a, there was a pr- uh, program on the radio called Amateur Hour and people could vote for the people. that. So they, uh, they did a number there with uh, trumpet and drums and they won the competition. And uh, so that was all good and eventually my brother was a trumpeter. He was my second eldest brother. He, he became a professional musician eventually. He lived on the, on the coast. His wife's still here. And... Um, uh, he's passed away since then. But um, uh, so we were coming, doing very well in the music world. They cut a record. Uh, he got involved with the uh, – just this is all backdrop, but he got involved with a great band called The Sounds of Seven, which used to be one of the great bands at the uh, uh, at the uh, Cloudland Ballroom, which he used to have on a Saturday night, 2,000 people for, a, for, for dancing and music and fun and balls and all that kind of thing. That's a lot of people. Uh, yeah. It was uh, built by the Americans and they used it greatly during the war and it was huge. It was the place to go. Sorry? Was that in Brisbane? Yeah, Brisbane, yeah. Okay. yeah it's been pulled down um, in the Joe years. and uh, But it was a fantastic <laughs> place to go for, for entertainment. So uh, it'll take me a minute to just find this picture. But, that's uh, right. You find it. No rush. Yeah. So uh, they we got pulled away from the from the band and um, the uh, uh, and we went into the second. And then we were coming down the coast and I got involved with rugby league football and uh, was going through all the junior ranks. All my brothers did that before me and and uh, then eventually. So between music and lifesavers, we were just going down a road uh, away from the church. And, uh, and so the opportunity was lost. But uh, God, I always knew he had a hand on me. Even when I was doing patrols, even though the, all the kids were pretty naughty, all the, the guys and the lifesavers was pretty rough and, mm. and quite immoral actually. They, um, uh, the senior guys were really bad examples. Uh, at, at Tugan here they had uh, um, terrible, you know, s- centrefolds all around the pictures and uh, all around the wall. So the young kids that were coming through, uh, 13, 14, like me, 15, 16, we, uh, we were exposed to all of that uh, negative stuff. Yeah. And uh, But by the grace of God, uh, I was always God aware and I even when some of the Catholic boys would go off to Mass, I would think, I wish somebody would invite me to go to their church. I'd go along <laughs> on a Sunday morning in between, you know, all your activities and the surf life saving movement. So we... Um, <clears throat> but uh, I was fortunate. My first job was in the city hall, and uh, there was a guy there that was going to an Anglican church in Brisbane. It was a very big church, twelve hundred families, five hundred in the in the Sunday school in a suburban church in in Cooparoo. <laughs> um, you know, in Australia in those days, in the fifties, ninety percent of the ch- children went to Sunday school, and uh, and now it's about one percent. 
So um, the um, so we we were uh, I was you know it was a big church, a big uh, congregation, three services on a Sunday morning, one in the night time, and then all the activities. Far out. So, uh, but what in the sovereignty of God around the sixties, early sixties, of course, there was a social revolution with all of the the age of Aquarius, as they used to call it then, and a lot of the teenagers were pulling away. Billy Graham had been here in 1959, had huge impact in Australia, 140,000 people at the MCG, 110,000 at the Sydney Cricket Ground, uh, Brisbane Exhibition Ground packed out. Uh, I don't know what the numbers were, but uh, probably around about 70,000, 80,000, all on the grass. The crowd number, numbers have never been surpassed. They had radio uh, lines uh, going to all parts of remote Australia and um, <clears throat> he uh, had a huge uh, role in bringing a real awakening amongst the people who were already orientated to going to church and Sunday school. I remember that, uh, you know, at that meeting in Melbourne, 140,000, 10,000 people went forward uh, in those days. So, so Australia had this amazing movement mm. and I heard Billy Graham in 59 I didn't understand it all but one of my brothers went forward the trumpeter and um and so there was we were exposed to all of these things so when my friend invited me to go to this youth group I said yes I'll come along ah. so your brother went to the Billy Graham in Brisbane yeah cool. all of our family did yeah we were exposed to it every I mean well, that, were you there I was there but I was only uh, very young uh, I was 12. So I liked, <laughs> I liked it. Cool. I loved the atmosphere. Uh, the next time when he came out in 68, I was in the choir behind him because by that time I was saved. And, uh, really? Yeah. So we, we just loved going and we just fully participated. When, once I got saved, but I, I just, you know, it's getting a bit higgledy-piggledy, but I'll just <laughs> catch up. That My friend at work invited me. He said, there's a lot of nice girls at, uh, at the youth group, which there was. That's a good pitch. And uh, we... Uh, and we went there and, uh, and it was just, you know, they did fantastic things, um, activity. They had a cricket team and, um, and, and uh, they did a lot of social programs which were really good and entertaining um, and uh, they taught. They used to get some of the well-known uh, people, uh, one of the ladies who was um, well-known in deportment and got there and would teach boys and girls how to date and how to dress and how to conduct themselves in courtship and all that kind of thing, you know. So that well, they, they would teach. Courtship. They would teach that, yeah. Teach you how to go on a date and how to to do the right thing and look after each other and, and, and be polite. And what? Okay. Be moral. Can, can we? Um, <laughs> can we? Do you remember what the what the points were? Like, what was dating back then? What did they teach? Well, uh, you know, you open the door for girls and uh, and things like that. Uh, everybody had to wear a suit and tie, and you had to dress nicely. You had to walk on the right side of the road with your girlfriend. Or you know, with your you know your date, like you had to walk on the side on the roadside because that goes back to the days when they had wagons and mud, and so you'd take the mud and keep the ladies' dresses clean. Oh, but God, they still bit, carried that over. This is heresy now that nowadays you you couldn't talk about this now. <laughs> God forbid a man should open a door for a woman. That's, I know. Um, All of that's changed. Oh wow, that's cool. So they would teach that. They did. That was part of the youth group program. They would teach you how to date, how to approach, and so therefore, because many of them eventually found uh, their life partners there, and um, and uh, they would teach you how to uh, conduct yourself on a date, and how to dress, how to present yourself, <laughs> I love, I love what this. clothes to wear. Um, you know, what, it was all about being proper. And how were relationships back then? Was it pretty? Well, people were people have always been sinners, and they there was <laughs> you could get into trouble if you wanted to, but it was very hard uh, to uh, get into trouble morally because girls weren't available, and uh, they were very insistent that you know they wanted to uh, be married before no sex before marriage and things like that. It happened, but it was rare. It happened. If people were got into got drunk and parties, then things would happen. Jeez, I'd love to see the statistics on uh, on certain things in comparison nowadays to then. When my the wife pop- Joan, she she went to we both went to the Cabaret High School, and um, she uh, went to a fortieth or fiftieth anniversary of her school class. Of, and there was a, in those days the classes at primary school were 50 to 70 kids in one classroom. 
because of the baby boomers. Teachers were – they were re-employing old soldiers who had been teachers and things like that. They were so short of teachers. They had big classes. But of the, that reunion, only one had died, only one had divorced. And that was of uh, about – I think hers was about 55 couples – only one divorce and, only, and one had passed away. And that was 50 years later and they are all married to the same person. That was the kind of approach to relationships that you had in those days. So would it be accurate to say that the, the generation that were raised when 90% of the population were in church 50 years later or 60 years later, whatever, at a school reunion, 99% of those people that were raised in that time were still married. That's right. Still married, uh, were faithful, they believed in their um, in their wedding vows. Even if they were having uh, difficulties, they stuck it out and uh, yes. for the sake of the children and economically it was very hard for women because uh, this is another stupid thing is that women when they got married or pregnant uh, had to leave their job in those days. <laughs> Do you believe that in our culture, that women were forced to leave their jobs when they got married? What was the point? Well, it was the idea that she's going to be uh, pregnant um, pretty soon because there was no uh, no pill in those days and not in those, not until later on. So women got pregnant fairly quickly and so they had to be homemakers. That was the expectation. That was the Christian teaching. That was the, the teaching that the men were the breadwinners and the women were the homemakers and they looked after the children and they made sure that they were well cared for, and, of course, many of them, you know, made their own clothes and so on, but this is getting a little... Well, that's, yeah, that's that's cool, though, because it's that's what's needed and, you know, how many of the issues in the kids today, um, you know, the, the kids that are stealing cars and doing crime, how many of them have a mum at home that's a homemaker that's sole purpose is to look after them and yeah. love them and... Yeah. Well, that was the values of the community. So the families were very much more secure, and um, and that was what they did. So we, I was, so when I came back, came into the church through this invitation, the youth group. I was very happy to go there because I'd had those good memories of the Salvation Army. Yes, yeah. uh, and I, and once I started to see. But the way they conducted themselves and the way they were teaching us how to conduct relationships, all of that was such a contrast to if you became a wild child. And, and yeah. once, unfortunately on the coast in those days, the opportunities were there to get into trouble morally and things like that if you wanted to go to there. So praise the Lord. Uh, I, the Lord just brought me right into that thing and I walked away from it because I just uh, couldn't uh, – I didn't like it. And uh, so I, uh, I think that was all part of the fact that there was something inside me from, from the Lord uh, from my earliest years and he had his hand on me. And uh, in hindsight, I can see all of that now. So then uh, the camp was coming up, youth camp was coming up, which was always a summer camp, uh, late November, early December. And, and um, so I said to my friend, can I go to the youth camp? But at that stage I wasn't saved, I was just attending the youth group and enjoying the, what they were doing. And uh, he said, oh, you've got to be a member of the church to go. And he actually put me off from going to this camp where they used to have a preacher who would preach the gospel and get kids saved if he could. That was, it's an evangelical church, that particular church. And um, a lot of them came from more college backgrounds, so it's a very strong Bible teaching, Reformed church mm. theology and um, uh, uh, Reformed theology. And so they had a strong emphasis on on evangelism and uh, and winning people to Christ, and very big supporters of the of the Billy Graham movement. So the uh, uh, we uh, but he said no, you can't come. He thought that I would be bad for the other kids at that stage, <laughs> and uh, I said, oh okay. I, I didn't know what membership in a church was, so I, I just I just thought he started to attend. So for the next year, I did attended, still enjoyed all those things. And, uh, and then uh, the next camp came up and I said, well, I, I must be a member, I'm going to go this year, so I went. And uh, this was the lovely thing is that uh, this is the sovereign grace of God. Uh, and um, so I was, you know, we were, I was loving the surf, showing off a little bit uh, <laughs> uh, uh, what I could do as a swimmer. I was a club champion down here, so I, I, did, I did pretty well in swimming and so on and um, belt races. And uh, the... Uh, uh, so, and we were just showing off as boys do with girls and so on. 
But there was, there's, there was a guy there that was just teaching the Bible and I understood but didn't understand. I only had a Sunday school understanding, a small child's Sunday school understanding of, of the message of Christ. But uh, he was, uh, t- I, I was liked what I was hearing and I listened very carefully but didn't fully comprehend it all. And then on the Sunday morning they had a communion service, an Anglican communion service in which they go through the prayer book and they do a formal prayers. They're beautifully written prayers. Mm. But as they were leading up to the communion and they were uh, sharing the uh, t- doing the prayer of confession, they call it, there was one phrase there that absolutely just penetrated my soul. And it says, We are not worthy, O Lord, to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you, O Lord, are a God of mercy. That's the only phrase I could remember. And at that moment, for no reason, I was the big tough footballer, lifesaver, I started to weep. And I just was touched by this uh, prayer of confession in the lead up to a, a communion service. And I said to a friend of mine beside me, I said, something's happening to me, John. And he said, are you becoming a Christian? And I said... I think so. <laughs> so it was not, a, not having an appeal going forward. I was just, just the words. I felt, well, when I read later on about Wesley, who talked about my heart being strangely warmed when he was in a meeting, and he puts that down to the moment of conversion for him, even though he was raised in the church. Uh, that's described, that really was describing what was happening. I just knew, in hindsight, I could just knew that God just said, I'm going to get you, boy, and, uh, and this is the moment. But I was responding to uh, a, a need for forgiveness uh, and a desire for forgiveness and my conscience was uh, exercised and, um, and so I knew the difference between right and wrong and I knew what sin meant, even though I wouldn't have used that word, just right and wrong. And then I, uh, I found that uh, it, it, there was just this, um, I was absolutely changed in that moment. So in the afternoon they were packing up the bags to go on the bus to come back to Brisbane and uh, as we, um, uh, just before we went onto the bus, they were asking people to give a, a testimony, I suppose you'd call it, uh, just to share anything that they had found helpful in, in the weekend. And I jumped up to my feet and said, well, I th- I've become a Christian this weekend. And as soon as I said that, it was all sealed. And the next day was your conf- at, yeah. at work, I couldn't <laughs> stop talking about it. I told my boss... Uh, I found an amazing Bible verse in, the, in Timothy which uh, said, you know, um, uh, flee youthful lusts and give yourself to the Lord. I wrote all these verses up, which was to young Timothy, stuck them up on the wall in my office in the, in the city hall and I started witnessing from then on for anybody that would come near me. I started telling the story of how Jesus could change your life and uh, I was dramatically changed. And I became a, a very zealous personal evangelist and um, I led guys to the Lord started a, or took over a, a fellowship that was a, in its infancy in the city hall and, and, and promoted it. I used to have a meetings there. Got involved with CBMC, which is a Christian businessmen's fellowship. It's sort of an evangelical version of the full gospel businessmen's uh, kind of fellowship. They were running parallel. One was Pentecostal, one was evangelical. So I met a lot of businessmen who were Christians and, and different churches and they took me under their wing and mentored me. And, um, and uh, one, the Sunday school superintendent, he was a watchmaker in the city and I used to go there and pray with these men once a week for the city of Brisbane uh, when I was, all, I was as a teen. And, then, and I started inviting men to these businessmen's lunch, uh, dinners where they would give testimonies and people would get saved. So I was uh, just uh, excited to be doing that. But in, uh, sort of uh, during that time, if I was down the coast and I picked up life, uh, uh, hitch- hitchhikers, I would preach the gospel to them. I, uh, we did, I got involved with uh, various ministries uh, on the coast here eventually and, and we had open-air meetings in the back of a truck preaching in Cabell Avenue, preaching the gospel in the open air. I was happy to be in the open air because that's what I was when I was a three-year-old. So I'm just trying to you know, to, for the sake oh, of time, yeah. move it along a little, uh, fairly quickly. <laughs> but I be just job. became on fire for the Lord and, uh, and loved it and loved doing it, loved sharing. And, uh, and so I became a bit of a uh, leader in the youth group and uh, in that sense. And anybody that was unsaved in the youth group, if they got near Reg, they, uh, they eventually made a commitment <laughs> to Christ. So uh, we got caught up in the 68 Billy Graham crusade. So that was 1964. 
And so the, those next few years, I was 17 and uh, then Billy Graham came again. So there was all of that for Brisbane and so the churches were all involved. I would take people, anybody that I'd led to the Christ, uh, I'd just say, well, where do you want to go to church and what's your family background? And so some of them were Catholic, some of them Presbyterian. And I just went to any church where they weren't encouraged them to grow in their faith because I had no idea about uh, denominations yeah. or, or theology. I just... I still Sharing don't have any idea about denominations. <laughs> I don't, I don't no. care. So we, uh, uh, it was all really going very well. But let me go back to the camp and what else happened, if I yeah, may. Yeah, please. Because <laughs> I, was, I, I was a bit of an amateur photographer and I had a roll, roll of film that I was taking pictures and I had one left and I wanted to finish it off and get it developed. At, this is at the camp. And so as we were packing the bus up after I'd made my confession of faith, I uh, said to my friend who was standing near me, I said, uh, who's that girl over there? I just wanted to take a picture. And he said, oh, that's Joan. She's a nurse. And, uh, and uh, he knew her very well, had dated her once. And, um, and I just said, hey, Joan. And she turned around and I took my first picture of my f- future wife and didn't know it. Oh, man. And uh, that was, so within two hours of... Making my confession, I got saved in the morning, took, made my confession in the afternoon, took my first picture of my f- future wife. She'd made a commitment to Christ uh, in October that year uh, in the nurses' quarters at uh, the month before PA. You? Yeah, a month before me, so oh. we're all simultaneously. And she had, in her personal circumstances, had said that she would never date a guy until it was the one she was going to marry. And so, uh, so. Uh, she had made that commitment to the Lord. She was uh, really uh, – she'd been raised in that Anglican church, so she had uh, – was exposed to Anglican Christianity. But uh, we uh, – eventually she uh, – sh- uh, some months later they were having a, a, few, a, a night at the movies. Uh, the young people were inviting different boys and girls were meeting uh, like that and – so I said to my friend, I'm a bit shy, believe it or not, <laughs> when it comes to girls, and I said, who could I take? And he said, why don't you go and ask Joan for a date? So I, uh, I said to her, um, I said, uh, I'm a bit shy, would you ask her for me? So my friend, who I'd, he was the guy that was at work who brought me to that church, all right, and invited me to come to the church, and uh, we were good mates. So he went and asked Joan, and I was just lingering in the background, <laughs> But she'd been watching me and had watched all the changes and saw my zeal for the gospel. And when he said, would you like to go out on a movie night date with Reg? She said, yes. But at that point, she ne- and she never told me this till years later, but at that point she had decided, she knew that that was the one that she was going to marry. Wow. And, um, so I, I was, God's initiative was all around the yeah. way we came to Christ. Uh, came together, the environment of that youth group and the way they taught people how to conduct relationships, all of that played into um, uh, a wonderful way in which God brought us together and uh, I'm very really proud beautiful, of that. It's really beautiful, eh? It's given me an idea. Yeah. I think we should start, why don't we do that these days, you know? Why not? Why, why don't we teach young Christian people? It was successful, worked well. We need, and God knows we need more um, manners, let's call it manners and respect these days for Absolutely. each other. It was all about respect, mm. courtesy, and, uh, and in the context of learning how to be a, a, a Christian with values. Wow. But for me, see, I'd walked away from a lifestyle, so I didn't want anything. So when I heard good things, I just loved it. Cling to it. Yeah. yeah. I, I feel you. I think a lot of young people are just uneducated. They just don't get the information. Or they get the information, they get all the wrong information yeah. and they're like, this is what you want, this is what you want, have what you want. Mm-hmm. Don't, um, don't be a sucker and, uh, and practice self-control and respect and no, no, just do whatever you want whenever you want it. Now I want to, may I uh, tell you another story? I felt Please. when I was thinking about this, I wanted Please to do. share a story of what happened with my father. Um, uh, Mum was lovely, she's always been the, the security in our life. Uh, tragically, she was killed in a car accident on the way to the coast when she was 52 and I was 20. And um, mm. so that's uh, another story. And I lost her and I, I regret that I've never had a chance to be able to speak to her as an adult about our life and family history. But um, 
Dad was a hard man. He was raised on a farm. He's a uh, uh, Welsh background. Had His father, I found out, had been exposed to the Welsh revival. I believe that there's a heritage that I have tapped into there. Yeah. Um, wow. Uh, both on the Salvation Army sign and the Welsh revival. Um, I've been to the Bible College of Wales. I've uh, I prayed with the son of Rhys Howells, if you know that man. Rhys Howells, yeah, intercessor. Howells, his, uh, the intercessor. His yeah. son Samuel was there in his 80s and we went to visit there because that book had a huge impact on Joan and myself uh, as young believers. This book rocked me 12 months ago. It's a brilliant book. I was just crying, painting a house, reading it. Yeah. Well, we uh, we had we went back and we just uh, were able to stay there and uh, met all the people that had been in the revival that they uh, when God visited them and, wow. and when they were praying for the war. All we met those old intercessors. They're all in their seventies and eighties by that time. I went into a, 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 just a little aside, but I went into a, what they call the blue room. It was kind of a it was painted and and it had a blue. Uh, couches and so on like that. And it was where the Holy Spirit had fallen upon them in the 1930s and uh, led them into their uh, experience and it's in the book. And I was alone in that book and I was just taking a, a, in the a room. picture. In the room. Yeah. Uh, somebody told me where it had happened, said this had happened here, Reese House was there, the women here, this is what the Holy Spirit did and fell. And I was sitting in that room and then they just left me to meditate on it and I'm sitting there taking a picture of a beautiful painting they had on the wall of The Last Judgment and suddenly the Spirit of God in that room just came upon me and I started to, to just uh, become drunk in the Spirit, uh, as, as we would say, you know. And um, so the sheer presence that's still in that room is so amazing. But uh, we, we had been um, – so I, I had learnt a lot about hearing the voice of God from that book in the early days and, um, and so I uh, – we had uh, – Developed a, 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 you know, we were learning to pray in, in the way that he was teaching to do intercession, and um, and that has continued on for right through our life. But um, as I would have my quiet time, I was wanting to put things right in my life, and so there was stuff that I I started to deal with. Uh, we had had a fallout, had a street fight with our neighbours, and. And I felt, well, if you're going to love your neighbours yourself, you've got to resolve that. So yeah. I decided to approach an, uh, one of our neighbours. What was, sort of street fight are we talking about? Uh, kids and really full-on fists and it was a real you street your, fight. You and your brothers? All my brothers and them and theirs and the neighbours. It was a wild Why? street what fight. Happened? What happened? Uh, we just hated each other's guts. <laughs> uh, people would argue, yell, scream at each other, swear at each other. And it, it ended up in a street fight, and we won. Uh, uh, so, but, and so we never talked to those people ever again. And we used to throw stones at their dogs, and <laughs> so this was a kangaroo point. It's shipyard, working class. In uh, when nineteen? Pardon? Nineteen when? This is about nineteen. Uh, this is the fifties. This was long 1950s. before I say. This was before I say. This was when we were kids. So I, I, I wanted to put things right. Mm. Uh, I'd done petty thieving when I was a kid. I went and paid back everything uh, and added 20% of the – I did think cream buns at school and, and um, uh, tra- tram fare, sneaking into the movies for nothing. Uh, I just paid it all back. I wanted to do it. Uh, I did it freely to nobody. I had read about restitution in the Bible and I, it was part of my discipleship. So – I was putting everything right in those early years um, and, uh, I, and I was, it was, felt so good uh, to be able to write letters and, and include a, a money order and uh, send it to my school and send it uh, to uh, the uh, tax department, send it to the uh, bus companies and, and uh, uh, a couple of places I met Christians and they forgave me, <laughs> forgave the debt, <laughs> which was great. Wow. Uh, it took me about three years to, to work it all out and to do it at the rate I could afford. And how old were you? you were s- I was only 17, 18, 19. Wow. I was doing all of that in, in those first years of my discipleship. Wow. So p- part of, of course, putting things right was to forgive my father for the fact that he had also had a hot temper and, and he had there was domestic violence in the house. Yes. But um, I, I just want to testify to the, the amazing grace that saves so 68 came and I, as part of, I'd forgiven Dad for things. I'd worked through the memories of, of things that had been hurt, hurtful to me. And I, uh, 
had chosen to forgive and let it all go. And but I only knew my father as a as a very angry man uh, most of the time. I was fr- frightened of him, and um, and there was a lot of um, trauma. In I would say that now I wouldn't have known that word in those days, yeah. but it was certainly trauma. And um, and so, uh, but I just knew he was a sinner. <laughs> But I wanted him to find the Lord. And so when Billy Graham came again in 68, I invited him to the CBMC, that's the Christian Businessmen's Group, did a dinner at the exhibition grounds in Brisbane and they invited um, one of the co-evangelists of Billy Graham came and spoke and Cliff Barrows came and spoke. Uh, and then we went into the meeting with Billy Graham in the open air. So Dad heard all of that and it he got stirred up by it and but he he was resistant at, at another level to these things and he was justifying his life. Um, so there was a kind of a – for me it, it didn't get resolved and so I didn't know how to resolve this problem with – I was wanting to be reconciled with Dad and I wanted him to be saved. But I saw him as a sinner needing saving in those simplistic terms when I was young and I thought that would solve the problem. But uh, as we matured over many, many years and uh, eventually we got into full-time ministry, uh, that's another story, but uh, we, um, uh, years later I was uh, uh, visiting. We've got and, and we're pastoring a church in, in New South Wales and uh, we were coming to Queensland and I had had a conversation with a friend of mine who talked about his having, having, uh, had, having given his father a hug and I, I was on a mission trip and I, I said, Lord, I've never hugged my father in my life. I wouldn't even know how to do that. Oh, wow. So I said, would you please create an opportunity for me to, to have a hug with Dad? Um, so we were coming up from New South Wales back to Brisbane, went to visit him for Christmas to, and brought the grandkids to see him. And, um, and he gave them a present and uh, we gave them some money. And, and uh, as we were going, I said, give me a hug, Dad. And I went to... And I just grabbed him and I found, my, to my surprise, I kissed him on the cheek and uh, something broke because he started to cry and I have never oh. seen him cry. He was an angry man. He was tough. And um, uh, he got into an altercation once where he was stabbed 16 times and nearly died. So uh, <laughs> uh, that's another story too. But he was <laughs> – just, he, he, just throw that in there. <laughs> Oh, so a lot of stuff to <laughs> tears in my so, eyes, and then you just <laughs> so uh, yeah. Well, that was a week before we went to the mission field, and uh, <laughs> I had to visit him in hospital, and he nearly died. Anyway, oh, so this French. so, but this event happened after we'd come back uh, from four years in Bangladesh and as missionaries, and then we um, were visiting him. Anyway, we then moved back to Brisbane, and. Um, and I started to visit him, and now I was a mature adult, and um, and I he lost his sight. He had uh, glaucoma, and uh, and so I had to take care of his needs and take uh, charge of his affairs, and uh, and so I was seeing him regularly, taking making sure he had enough food in the house and uh, clean the house and all that kind of thing. Eventually, uh, I started to hear his story, and. Uh, I was surprised to find that in 1934, my mother and himself had gone to an evangelist tent meeting in uh, in Lismore. It was a Church of Christ evangelist, and uh, they'd preached the gospel. And both of them had gone forward, and I didn't know this. Nobody had ever said that to me. My mother never told me that. Uh, they baptized them the same day as the Church of Christ did in those days, because they believe have a doctrine that you have to be baptized to be saved, and. Um, and I was astonished and I thought, well, what happened? Where was the Christianity? <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, good. Fair question. <laughs> well, they were classic people that had sort of made a response to the crusade but whilst mum had a Salvation Army background and she had a kind of a basic faith behind everything, she taught me to pray when I was a little kid and so on. Dad uh, just uh, was interested in religious things but he – there was no evidence of any change. There's no disciples yet. Uh, and, uh, and life was tough and it did, was what it was. So I was re- reflecting on this and then one day I was uh, in Kurung Bookshop 
And I heard the Lord say to me, go to your father, read Acts 2, lead him in a sinner's prayer and, I, and ask him to receive the Holy Spirit. Repent and be baptised for the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I thought, how does that work theologically? I'd been raised in an evangelical environment and, and all that kind of thing and I thought, how can he go forward and not have the Holy Spirit? Well, people can go forward and make a kind of a, an emotional response to things and they can yeah. even make an, a mental ascent, but are they fully born again? We don't know. So the, the one thing that's for sure is that until you're born of the Spirit, you can't enter the kingdom of God in that sense, in, that, in the sense that you don't come into all that Christ uh, teaches you about. So a lot of the evangelicals, of course, they emphasise repentance, faith, be baptised, but they don't talk a lot about the Holy Spirit. They just assume that the Spirit's in it when you make it re- and receive Christ. So I was astonished that the Holy Spirit was saying this to me. So I went to him and uh, I said, Dad, uh, the Lord has spoken. But this time I was having some pretty good conversations with him. And, um, and I said, the Lord has just spoken to me that I want you to read this passage of Scripture to you. I said, in 1934 you went forward. But I said, something was missing. That's obviously on our family history. I said, I think it's to, something to do with the Holy Spirit. I don't know why it has to be like this or what, what, what all the gaps were. But all I know is that the things that are absolutely essential is that you must repent of sin, you must believe in Christ, you must be baptised and you must re- welcome and receive the Holy Spirit to bring that life of Christ into your life. I said, something's missing. And I think it's the, the, Spirit, the Holy Spirit's experience of being what's being born again. So I read the passage. I said, would you pray with me? And he said, yes. He said, what's this thing about tongues? I said, no, don't worry about that. I said, I I do that. I have the gift. But I I said, if it happens, it happens. But don't worry about it. You just pray the prayer. So he he did that. And you can't believe it. A miracle took place. He, as he did that, he was completely changed from that day on. The Spirit of God came upon him and he began to witness everywhere. He had a friend who used to come up and have a cup of coffee with him because he'd lost his sight and he used to read to him. And he said, read the Bible to me. So he got this guy who used to come along. He was a pensioner, another pensioner, and he used to read the Scripture, have a cup of tea, and they would read the Scriptures. And then he said, uh, tell him the good news, Reggie. Tell him the good news. I don't know what to say. All I know is uh, a prayer. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. Lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. He'd learned that from the Anglican days. He was in that church in, in his youth. And... Uh, and uh, so then we went to other people. I used to take him because he couldn't drive anymore. So I'd take him on his social visits to different ones and he would say, tell him the good news, Reggie, tell him the good news. And then by that time I was in a church in Brisbane and uh, I was preaching and he would come to the services at night time and he would jump up at the front of the church and say, listen, you people, this is my son. He's sharing the good news. Listen to what he's saying. This was this was a man that was went from being a victim of domestic violence. Uh, we were, I mean, a man perpetrating domestic violence, to being completely changed through the reading of Acts two, and then making sure that he had covered all the bases of those steps. And all I can say is that 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 to me was one of the greatest miracles and of reconciliation, of healing, and of transformation. That happened in my family, and I finally was able to take Dad's funeral and send him off to glory when he passed. And, uh, oh and, uh, man! Well, uh, <laughs> I just wanted to tell that story. No, that's honestly perfect. I uh, this is why we do testify. Hey, I'm really the whole time you're sharing. I uh, I f- uh, you really took me there, eh? And I f- <laughs> I feel like I was just in the good old days for a minute, <laughs> and that is why we testify. It moves you uh, hearing the testimony of God's goodness in your life. And I know we probably scratched the surface of this much, just like when you threw in your dad got stabbed 16 times or 17 times. <laughs> yeah, 16 um, times, yeah. Yeah. Oh, Reg, thanks. That's all right. And thanks for sharing. Yeah. Uh, just really powerful, hey. It really has really moved me. And I needed to hear this today. We get in our own world and our problems become so big to us and then just hearing – the powerful simplicity of God in your life um, 
just really encouraged me today. And even the Reese Howes book, I was like, I forgot. When I read that, I was crying. Well, I was actually listening to it. I wasn't reading it. I was listening to it while I was painting. And I just cried about like how complicated I make things and how like simple God, his, his powerful, extravagant, amazing things happen, but it's really simple. It is actually. And you just reminded me of that today. Yeah. And um, I'm thankful for that, mate. So I just, well, uh, my thing that I love about God is the fact that he's sovereignly moving in, a, in everybody's life. Yeah. And I always feel as I'm a responder to his grace that's uh, initiated so many things. I mean, we ask and seek and knock and we uh, obey whatever we uh, get to understand from the scriptures as best we can and we do it together as a church. And, and um, But ultimately he wants us to come into this beautiful relationship with him and with one another. Yeah. Love God, love your neighbour, love your family. Yeah. And, uh, and to, uh, today when you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. And follow the voice. This is what Reese Howes used to call it, the voice. And, the voice. Uh, we, it was such a blessing. That book was such a blessing to us in those early days. It led us everywhere. I was always listening, waiting on God and, until we heard the voice. And, uh, and, then, so and, it was, and that was what led me to be able to get past all of the pain and the misery of Dad's hard heart was to simply obey what the Holy Spirit spoke into my mind while I was sitting in, uh, in a Christian bookshop. And, yeah, it's um, powerful. So uh, I need to re-read. It, and that's what – everything comes out of that, ministry, everything. Yeah. You know, as we know. Oh, mate. Well, thank you so much that's for your right. time today. That's all right. I'm, it's, uh, it's been great and this is going to bless some people. Okay. So I hope you've enjoyed the podcast. Yeah. And if you want uh, you want to hear part two of Reg, just uh, – Make a comment down below maybe and we'll get on to getting Reg back in here. But thanks, mate. I appreciate your time. Thank you for having me and uh, it's a privilege to share with you. Thank you. Praise the Lord.